Hey, y'all. You have an opportunity to come and kick off the Halloween season with me, Patrice, and bartender Courtney at Romarin at Corbeau in Oxford, Alabama on October 8th at 7 p.m. Though, I mean, we know if you're listening to us, you probably kicked off the Halloween season two months ago. But we will have at this event giveaways, photo ops, and special discounts from Romarin at Corbeau, which is your local, well, if you're in Oxford, mom and pop metaphysical bookshop. They have all kinds of really cool stuff, and you will definitely want to take advantage of some of those discounts. And we might just bring a haunted doll or two when we have this show. So come join us, come enjoy yourself, and we can't wait to see you there. Go to thestrangesouth.com to order tickets. Is that true? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's the worst promo ever. I no, that was that. good. That was good. <laughs> that was good. If you're looking for a clean, sober, professional, academic, well-researched, historically accurate, generally accurate, serious podcast on Southern folklore, ghosts, bizarre events, and unique people, this podcast is not for you. However, if you've decided you can live with that, then join us for The Strange South. start bringing an extendable back scratcher everywhere I go. Just in other news. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So we have stories. We do have stories. We have stories to tell this evening. Hi, Marleya. Hi, Patrice. It's just like old times. It's weird, it though. Is it's weird. weird now. We have an empty I chair. Know. I know we do. It feels the room feels empty. Courtney, we miss you. Courtney is not feeling well. Feel she has the crud. Yes. As I'm sure half of you do. Everybody's Tis got the crud. The season. Tis the season for the crud. Yes. Also, um, just a reminder with seasonal depression kicking in Thank for some God. of us here. Take your meds. Take your meds. Go get your meds. If you need to get like a refill, just go ahead and do it. Yep. Do it right now. Stop right. what you're doing. Go Pause take... this podcast. Yes. So your refill. Yeah. Mental health. So important. And with school starting up and all the stressors happening and the change of the season that's happening, but it's still hot as fuck outside. Um, that's depressing in and of itself. Mm -hmm. It's like you look out and all the leaves are falling and you realize it's not because it's fall. It's because they're dried up and they're dead. <laughs> and it's like, they're dying. You're all, I mean, our, everything is so confused right now. Our uh, bodies are so confused. We're like, there's pumpkin spice. Right. Pumpkin spice. It's like and 94 degrees. Sweaters. And then as soon as I walked out, it's like instant like humidity, hair frizz. Like the hair frizz is strong this week. Oh my God. Yes. It's it is crazy. So bad. Well, and you know, I mean, if you're God, I mean, and there's been a lot of shit going around. Yeah, like yeah. Jackson, like um, there's flooding. There's flooding in a lot of places still. There's yeah. people recovering from stuff. So y'all take your meds. Take your meds. And, you know. Drink lots of water. Think about the good stuff. The Halloween season is upon us. You mm -hmm. know, that's the good stuff. That's mm -hmm. the fun stuff. We can enjoy. We can all be fucking fools. We can be fools and we can enjoy our spooky shit. Right. And do it up and and look forward to it. Absolutely. As I do. Yes, that's like that's like the one positive that you know spooky season is is happening. All like Target and Spirit of Halloween. Spirit and, of Halloween opened like two months ago, ago. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and um, oh, who else had? Oh, uh, Michaels had like awesome, mm. you know, spooky stuff. And I started I start buying for the pod basement, like all kinds about that little uh crow uh, table thing there which is you know what i'm we need to nice. do it we need to do a little visual tour of the pod basement i think we'll do that for our patrons oh, i think we'll take yeah. a little we'll take a little video a quick little video tour of the pod basement here sometime soon and yes. put it up there for our pay if you're not a patron and you want to get access to this kind of fun stuff that in our after talks we have like a bonus episode every every episode right pretty much for pretty now much. at yeah. least <laughs> And, right because we're all like we're so tired and we're so drunk <laughs> <laughs> and 
But if you want to hear that, get on it. <laughs> right. Patreon.com. You're slurring. You're slurring. <laughs> um, but it's only $3. Our entry level creepy dolls is three do- uh, $3. If you want the Sasquatch Squad and a t-shirt, then it's $15. And we do have some patrons that are partaking of the squad. And, and I, thank we, you so much. Thank you so much. You're the reason that we can afford hosting and to have all of our audio online and to do live shows which we're doing again so that is super exciting (laughs) i'm writing i'm writing a note to self (laughs) it begins note to self oh yes video tour pod basement yes love it let me clean up a little bit no you don't but It'll be so much fun. It's strange to have a pod basement that's actually part of someone's living space. It's like there's there's these weird, uh, I don't know, there's these weird uh, boundaries that we blur between what is appropriate as public space and what is appropriate as private space. Right? <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, since we pretty much dedicate, you cannot come into the pod basement and think it's anything other than a um, recording yeah. hang mm-hmm. for cool people like us i know it is obviously it just screams it when Mm -hmm. you walk in the door like literally Mm -hmm. screams right in your face all the haunted dolls that are looking at marlea on purpose i swear to god (laughs) (laughs) we were just trying to figure out what's been going wrong with our audio and i looked over patrice's shoulder at babette and i was like we didn't say anything about her did we (laughs) (laughs) i bet we but she she's she stares right at me into my soul every day every every time Oh, one thing I wanted to, I thought I was going to do this for the patrons, but I think this, this thing that I saw on Instagram is, goes with the mental health, like take your pills kind of deal that Mm -hmm. I was wanting to like emphasize to everybody because it's coming from like, I need to take and get back on my antidepressants because we're all struggling. Right. But this is this really cool thing that I saw. I was like, you know, this makes sense. It's, it's one of those, I'm just going to, I'm just going to tell you about it. So this is from Sassy Healthy Fit, and it came up. I don't follow this person, but you know how Instagram has been doing, where it's just like suggest people. And this mm-hmm. one wasn't a bad thing. And it's a piece of advice, especially when you're like in depression, you may not know it, and you hate everyone. <laughs> it happens. It happens. So the advice is, if you hate everyone right now, go eat something. Mm. And the next one is... If, if you feel like everyone hates you, then go to sleep. Mm. And then if you feel like you hate yourself, take a shower. Those are good. Right? Those are quick, simple ones to remember that way. Right. And then if it feels like everyone hates everyone, then just go outside. Mm -hmm. So these are just like quick little fix to put in your brain. Like if you're struggling this morning, I was struggling so hard. It was like, I hate myself and I hate everyone. And I I did take a shower, but I did not go outside. Well, I went outside for like five minutes. I'm like, it it's nasty fucking outside. hot. So <laughs> fuck this. I'm just going to hate everyone. Or <laughs> everyone's going to hate everyone. <laughs> Whichever one it is, right? But I thought that was um, just cool, quick little snippets. And it it is true. Um, instead of like getting bogged down with like a routine or meditation that's supposed to help you just, you know, try to look at it and then go take your fucking meds. Yeah. It's a yeah, quick fix sometimes is what you need like right. to get started. Sometimes you just need that leg up. You've got to get started somewhere, you <laughs> right. know? Right. Absolutely. But if you hate everyone, eat something. God, how many times has that been right in my life? My God. That's why I'm constantly eating. (laughs) Well, me too. I have that problem. I was like, oh, I should have had something before I came over here. I should have eaten something. Oh, man. This means I'm going to be hitting Dairy Queen for fish sandwich and onion rings when I leave here. Can You can tell. That's very specific because I already thought about it. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Now I'm thinking about it and I may just like join you. Oh, my God. Oh, my Lord. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So this morning, yeah, just to hate everybody and, and myself and just the whole thing. But the thing about it is I have a cut, like a paper thin cut on the bottom of my big toe. <gasps> and this is how my day has been going. Oh, my. And it's like every time my toe bends a certain way. Oh, my God. It has that paper cut pain <gasps> on my toe. And so every time that happens, I get so mad. Oh, my God. That's awful. You need to splint that shit for a while. Yeah. 
Yes, man. I got like a Band-Aid and socks and all kinds of things, but it just does not help. And it's and it's like every time that happens, like this whole day, I just like instantly <laughs> That's awful bad mood. And like everybody I know has been tiptoeing around me because I've just been like blowing smoke oh out God. of my nose. And then like I walk and I guess it's karma for me being in a bad mood and not like, growing the fuck up. <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> That's but not fair. every single time, it just like stabs and I'm just like, God damn, motherfucker. Oh, my God. That's, you know what? That's so real, though. That's oh. so legit. Gosh. But that's, anyway. So I'm going to try. Sorry. I'm going to try. Like, I already like saged out the whole pod basement. Mm. I saged myself out. Positive. Get rid of the negative. Jello vibes. Jello vibes. <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna be a t-shirt job. <laughs> oh and that's something i've been working on too oh oh patrice has been working on some merch and when we were talking about the uh the levels of the patrons i was like patrice sends this thing she put it up on those socials the other day that were uh the uh, awesome cat cult design that she's developed to put on <laughs> to put on merch Yes. And you're going to love it. If you haven't seen it yet, go and look for it. But I was like, we totally need to name one of our patron uh, tiers, Levels. the cat the cat cult. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. This is stout, what you poured here. I, I doubled it. Cause it's, I see. It's that day. I see. So I've already had one for sure. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I was about to I was about to write something down for myself, but I pretty you're, much already forgotten what it was. Jello was vibes. Jello vibes. Jello vibes. I'm on it. Well, and the reason Jello is on the brain is because we've been brainstorming some new fun things to do just because they'd be fun and it'd be fun. And, um, you know, my obsession with Jello, we've talked about this, we all know. And and Southern like grandma Jello salads and molds and all the kind of right. stuff you find at like church functions. Buffets. Right. And so Patrice and I started I went to a thrift store. She had stuff already in yes. her in I her library. Yes, I inherited grandma jello recipes that do not disappoint. Oh my God. So I was like, we need to do little video snippet jello taste test kitchen yep. of the actual like nineteen forties Baptist grandma stuff. Right. And so I was like, but the bad and so I started saying this and we were in our little our little text group and Patrice is what Courtney said she wouldn't have anything with shrimp in it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, OK, no olives for me. And Patrice is like, no vetoes. That's right. And I was no like, vetoes. what? And she's like, no vetoes. I was like, OK. And she's like, also no Internet. And I was like, you just fucked this up for me. Yeah. I was like, that's how I do everything. What do you mean? No Internet. And she's like, you find an old grandma cookbook and you find your recipes. And I was like, I don't got no goddamn grandma cookbook for this like my grandma from illinois and so i the next day i go down to the thrift store at center of hope in town doesn't disappoint i walk in first thing i find is the southern living salads cookbook which is just a fucking treasure trove oh of awfulness it has a <laughs> like a beehive jello mold on the front cover we will put this on the fan page it is and it is. So it, I can't even tell I, what's in this. I don't even know how you fit that in your fridge. It looks first like of all. I know it looks like it looks like there's probably cocktail onions and olives and carrots in it. But I I don't know. Man. Yeah, I don't know. I just told Patrice one of the funniest non jello recipes that I found was like this very simple recipe that's a sliced banana with chopped onions, lemon juice, a head of shredded lettuce garlic powder salt and pepper and you mix all that stuff up together and then you serve it with a dollop of mayonnaise on top for each person i may have just thrown up in my mouth <laughs> but like, if we do this shit. if we do this and we're gonna have to talk cordy in it because she, I, I feel like she's gonna be our toughest customer here oh, she, she just won't yeah <laughs> i was like everybody's got to take one bite you've got to you've got to you've got to take one bite and you've got to swallow it <laughs> You've got to, these are the rules I had for these, my children these, since they were three. These are the rules. You have to also swallow just, it. Just one bite and it has to go down. Mm -hmm. 
now what happens Whether after it that comes back up is that's, not my affair that's that's your problem so right. anyway if you guys have advice on how we should go forth in this great adventure of ours then let us know about your your preferences but we're gonna be videoing this somehow and starting a little fun series so send us your recipes oh be yes. kind or be, not whatever right you but know. You know, if you send us the recipes we need them from like granny cookbook granny cookbooks mm-hmm. they cannot be from the internet mm-hmm. and we need photos yes Right. Yes. All right. I think, is that all of our... I think that's it. That's all of our nonsense. I have just some folklore. Woohoo. This is my story today. Looking forward to it. So, oh God, I can't get these glasses on with these. Hold on. I'm, I'm blind. I'm old and I'm blind. So, in North Carolina, there's a place called... What, is yours in North Carolina too? No, go ahead. Okay. It's not the same, I promise. Mm, okay. It can't be. It can't be. It's can't not. be the same. No. This is, so there's a place called Chimney Rock. Are you going to go again? <laughs> no. Okay. So, <laughs> Chimney Rock and, and Hickory Nut Gap. These are two places that I've always loved because I've been there several times. This I need, I need fucking bifocals, man. I feel you. I love green space. I, I really like, I haven't done it recently. This is, is one of those things where you say as you get older, I really love hiking, but you don't hike as much. Right. <laughs> but um, I really love green space. And I kind of cultivated my whole house to like be about green space. And I like climbing on rocks and I like streams. And when I was in high school, my dad lived in North Carolina for a while because he was stationed down there while my family, the rest of my family was still in D.C. And so one summer... While he was still stationed there, we took a trip to uh, to Asheville, North Carolina and Chimney Rock Park. And um, it was I really loved it. I loved hiking. I loved climbing in there. So I went back with Randy in the fall of 2006. It was like right when people started first talking about baby moons as being a thing. So I'd found out I was pregnant. and I was like, we're going to do a baby moon. So we went in, to this Airbnb in, um outside of Asheville and we spent a lot of time at Chimney Rock Park. So it's it's beautiful areas for hiking there. Um it's gorgeous high waterfalls, um well-kept trails. There's all these really if you go all the way up to Chimney Rock and there are even higher places on the mountain than that, you can see like beautiful views of the Blue Ridge and the Carolina Piedmont. It's really really pretty and then below you can see Lake Lure. And it's like there's <laughs> there are all these um movie connections with this area i may have talked about this some before but they filmed the last of the mohicans the movie the last of the mohicans at chimney rock park like on the you know on the trails and everything mm-hmm. like that and so everybody in town had a picture when i went there the first time it was mid 90s every single store in town had a picture of daniel day lewis it was like the thing right so it was daniel day lewis and then uh at lake lure the inn on lake lure uh, is where they filmed parts of dirty dancing right i was gonna say dirty dancing has to play into this it was dirty dancing they Mm -hmm. had that big you know the um oh shit what was the name of the kellermans Mm -hmm. um that was that was the inn at lake lure and that actually burned down at some point and was rebuilt but um anyway so um you know if you go all the way up to the top of the chimney rock which is, you know, it kind of stands out from the the mountains around it. And it's just, it's honestly kind of phallic. It's like this big rock structure that's just like, Argh. but it's their big, um, it's their big cell, you know, like from, I, th- I think probably like the early 1900s and on, they would, you know, for 25 cents or whatever, you could take this boardwalk up to Chimney Rock and stand on top or sit on top. And um, so from the top of Chimney Rock, you can see for like 75 miles, it's, 2000 feet above sea level the rock chimney rock is 315 feet tall and you can go up even higher <clears throat> at chimney rock and the um like the top of the falls near there is hickory nut falls is like 2600 feet high so and you know if you do all this and you go through the park and you go all the way up chimney rock and at the end of it there's like a uh, a gift shop and it's this it's this celebration of old Appalachian culture there's always a guy playing the um the hammer dulcimer at the top you know at you know so it's just it's a thing Mm -hmm. and um so you know down below that all the cafes are like chimney rock themed and and all the stories that I knew of this place and I like I said I loved it it really is beautiful so you should go there if you haven't been but 
I didn't know that there were stories besides, you know, Daniel Day Lewis and Patrick Swayze stories that were from this era. And I did not give a shit when I was there <laughs> the first time. I was like, ooh, Daniel Day Lewis, he's so dreamy. And Patrick Swayze, of course. He was my like lifelong heartthrob. Right. When I started looking this up again, I found there were two like folkloric battles that I had never heard about that had to do with Chimney Rock and Hickory Night Gap. So I will tell them to you now. The first one is a, a First Nations tale. I, I got a lot of the information from this. Project Gutenberg has this. There was a Letters from the Allegheny Mountain by Charles Landman, and it was written in um, 1848 and 1849. And he was um, going through and learning stories of the local tribes in the local area. And so I was starting to read this, and he talks a lot about the fact that it's called Hickory Nut Gorge, but there don't appear to be any hickory nut trees there. You know, he describes the the chimney rock and all the things that he can see and the waterfalls that that I've talked about a little bit. I, I kind of was trying to picture going to a place like this with, you know, massive elevation rocks, you know, big gorges and all these huge waterfalls before they had boardwalks and before they had you right. know, cut trails and everything. So, I mean, he said that it was just one of the most beautiful and fantastic places he had ever seen. So, you know, he's wandering around and he's trying to find out more and he wants to know the original tribal name of this this mountain where the chimney rock stands. And so he goes to talk to the Cherokees in one of the local towns and they didn't actually answer the question he went there for. But there was a chief there and his name was All Bones and Flying Squirrel. And he told him a two hour folklore about the chimney rock instead. But unfortunately, this like Charles Landman clipped it to a five minute story. So we don't have the whole thing. Damn it, Charles. But I got I got a couple of other sources and added to it. So it turns out that um, the land beyond the chimney rock was actually called Suwali Nunend. And it was part of a trading path that followed a river there. And there was a time when in this story, the the chief talked about a time when the Cherokees were without the famous so lung or the tobacco weed, which, according to Charles Landman, they had previously been made acquainted by a wandering stranger for the Far East, which really isn't true because tobacco was a plant a native. that native tribes had known for a really, really long Crop, time. Yeah. And traditional tobacco was sacred in its original agricultural form was sacred and had medicinal value, had spiritual qualities. You know, in some tribes, tobacco was there was only certain people in the tribe, certain groups of people that were even allowed to harvest tobacco because it was a special thing oh, and they needed wow. to pass that on to the next people to do it correctly. Oh, I believe that. And they gave it um, credit for easing suffering when you know, smoke it. And I was like, well, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, they used it as a gift. It was to promote emotional and physical well-being. And it's funny because it's like we kind of look at stuff like this and think about herbs and the ways that things are used. And like, I mean, I vilify tobacco. I vilify the tobacco industry for what right. it did to so many people right. and like the additives and and the way that it was marketed. But at the same time, I was like, these things aren't untrue. You know, I mean, right. to cultivate an herb and or not, it's not an herb, but to cultivate yeah, a plant, plant. Mm -hmm. and to use it for mm -hmm. these are medicinal purposes. Right. It's I remember legitimate. I, I used to smoke in college and I remember I had like this really horrible crud like it's going around now. And I had like, you know, the tickle in the throat mm -hmm. that made me cough and it just made me want to smoke more. And the more that I smoked, um, it eased it. I wouldn't cough as much, which sounds like counterproductive, right? And mm -hmm. I was talking to one of my friends who was in nursing school at the time, and he says that there's something about tobacco that it numbs the small uh, little hairs that's oh. like in your throat or whatever that causes you to like causes the tickling sensation when like you know you have drainage and stuff and he's, oh. and he's like so that's what's going on is why you're wanting to smoke more is because you're getting that relief huh and also you know it's an instant antidepressant yeah you know so and i mean so there you know the positives are there, there. are positives <laughs> there legitimately right if, um, it, if it didn't like yeah i would totally smoke today because <laughs> i loved it um <laughs> if you know you know, all the other bad things that go yeah. along with it. You know, it was used in all these ways. You know, they recognize kind of those same things that, mm -hmm. you know, this is you use it for this. You use it to ease certain types of ailments. Right. And there was even a ritual about like using tobacco, throwing tobacco on a fire to tell the future. 
it was used at war councils. And that part of that was where the kind of white trope of the peace pipe right. came from. It was like, it comes from mm-hmm. something that people actually did, but right. then it became kind of a, a caricature. But uh, so the pipe was a sacred thing that was, it was actually never belonged to one person in the Cherokee tribe. Apparently the pipe was something that was considered passed down from the creator and had to be like presented to the next person. It didn't Mm. belong to anyone. Wow. So the writer of this letter kind of just implies that they were addicted and, you know, people gave them this and blah, 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 but not that they cultivated this for, you know, tons of time. But in this story, in this folklore, the chief says the tobacco plant had gone scarce. They couldn't get access to it. And people were were ailing because they didn't have access to this plant. Yeah, it is addictive. Yes, it is. I mean, there's no joke. There's, there's no, no joke, joke about that. I right. mean, it really was. Mm-hmm. They said that there was a um, a country where the tobacco plant grew in really, really great quantities. And the gateway to that country was Hickory Nut Gorge, which they didn't call that. But it was perpetually guarded by an immense number of little people. Hmm. We've talked about we've the talked Native about American. the little people. Yes. Yeah, little. So that was like episode eighty eight. We talked about the Yunwe Junsi and they're like smaller than children. They have long hair. They like to play music. They're protective of their areas. They're generally friendly though. Mm-hmm. In this story, they are not friendly. Like oh. you don't want to piss them off. Gen- I mean, if they didn't feel friendly when we talked about them before, like most of what I had learned was that they might kidnap, like they might keep you. Right. But they're not gonna like murder you or something. Right. Make but this tobacco enemas. I know, right? Oh my god, <laughs> tobacco enemas. Shit, which episode was that? That was so good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> uh, look that up. These guys were protecting this gorge, and the Cherokee couldn't go through the gorge because they would be attacked by the little people if they would, went to get the tobacco. So a council was called to decide what to do. And first, this of course, this young warrior steps up and like grabs a giant sack and says, "I'm going to fill the sack and bring it home with tobacco." And he marches off and. He just never comes back. Mm. And one story says that the little people threw boulders down on him until he died. So they didn't fuck around with his gorge. And the Cherokee Nation waits for him. He doesn't come back. And people are getting more and more ill and more and more, you know, they really want their tobacco. And so they have another council. And this shaman rises and says, I will go visit tobacco country and see what I can do. So he leaves for the gorge. And when he gets close he's like you know what i'm gonna turn myself into a mole so he like becomes a mole and he digs under the ground and he tries to go under and like get up on the eastward side of the mountain but they see the track that he makes and they start like you know pounding the track and they chase him back out again he nearly dies so he he comes back out and he doesn't get any tobacco and he thinks and thinks and then he pulls out of his bag like the skin of a hummingbird and he puts it on turns himself into a hummingbird and he's like, OK, I can I can avoid them if I'm this tiny. So he flies in and he gets tobacco plant and he comes back out. But he's a fucking hummingbird. So he gets like half of a quarter of a leaf of tobacco because you can't <laughs> carry fucking tobacco when you're a hummingbird because you're tiny. And then he gets back to his country. He finds all like so many of his people are on the the verge of death that he so he placed some of the tobacco in a pipe and he breathes the the tobacco smoke and people start to be revived and it's addictive it's not that addictive i know right like people if they're dying they're not just going to come back to life because you're just going to be mad in this story i know <laughs> go take a shower <laughs> like thank you go take a shower um so the the hummingbird breathes life back into people and then um there's kind of an epilogue where the shaman decides he's going to get vengeance on the little people for whatever it was that they did to the young warrior and so he turns himself into a whirlwind and like makes havoc through the gorge and throws down all these rocks and strips trees. And they, the little people get scared and they run away and they never come back again. So they have access to all the tobacco. Oh, and I'm like, why wow. the fuck didn't you do that at the beginning? Like, why wow. did you just be a hummingbird then? Why didn't you just be a whirlwind? And also he brought the warrior back to life. And that's the, that's that part of that's the native story of Hickory Nut Gorge, oh. which I didn't know. Yeah. There's also a white people story about a battle in Hickory Nut Gorge. And Chimney Rock. Okay. So the earliest white settlers near that area were like 1805. Hmm. Okay. It's a little bit later than I thought. I know. Me too. Uh, I mean, it is really rough country. Okay. So there also, you know, I did some research, but I can't remember what it said. There was a reason. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There are reasons. There there are reasons. There are reasons why that happened. That's all right. Apparently, white people bring all kinds of weirdness with them when they come because (laughs) only two years after 1805... 
this weird shit starts to happen. And the Raleigh Register talks about it in their newspaper. It says this was <laughs> I'm going to sound like I'm lisping because in 1807, they still like printed stuff with the S that looks like the F. And <laughs> so I might read it wrong. But there was a woman named Patsy Reeve and she was a widow woman. She lived near uh, Chimney Rock in the Appalachian Mountains, it said. And on 31st of, for the 31st of July mm-hmm. in 1807, or 1806, it's like six o'clock and her eight-year-old daughter is out in the cotton field, which is 10 poles from the dwelling house, which stands six furlongs from Chimney Rock Mountain. And I'm like, I, I don't even know what this is. So furlong, I didn't know this. This is a little extra trivia. Comes from a furrow long, which is the distance that can be plowed by an ox without a rest. So that's what a furlong means. Oh, how, how, but how long is that? I have no idea. Cause I would, wait, like, it, I don't remember. Like, oxes probably don't tire out that. Oh, wait, fast. a furlong is 220 yards or an eighth of a mile. Oh, okay. So an ox can pull a row for an eighth of a mile without resting. Okay. That seems like a long way. Uh, yeah. The only time I've ever actually used furlong in modern life is when I watch horse racing. Like they still talk about furlongs. Oh, okay. Hmm. The mile was based on a Roman measurement of a thousand paces. That was just another like trivia thing. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Either. And one pole or one rod is 16 and a half feet. So this little girl, Elizabeth, is eight years old and she's standing in the cotton field and she tells her brother Morgan, who is 11, that she sees a man on the mountain. So doing all these computations of furlongs and rods and poles and shit. All right. He was more than a half a mile away, this person that she claims to see on the mountain. Okay. So Morgan doesn't believe his little sister, Mm -hmm. but she pushes the issue and she says, I see him up there rolling rocks or picking up sticks or something. And then she says she sees a heap of people up there, which still just sounds like an eight year old being like, I don't see just one people. I see a bunch of people now and you can't see anything. So Morgan, the brother, goes to the place where Elizabeth is and looks and sees, he says he sees a thousand or 10,000 things flying in the sky up at Chimney Rock. Bats. I know, right? (laughs) Let's see. And then another daughter of Mrs. Reeves, who is 14 years old, and a nurse run over to the children and they call Mrs. Reeves to come and see it. So Patsy Reeves goes towards them and she's not thinking, you know, she's like, I have no reason to be concerned. This is just ridiculous. But then she looks and sees a numerous crowd of beings, it says, resembling the human species, but did not discern any particular members of the human body nor definition of the sexes. They were of every size from the tallest men down to the smallest infants. Aliens. I know. (laughs) Seriously, if you search alien on Chimney Rock, there is shit out there. there, When we talked about the cave system, right? The Mm -hmm. mammoth cave system. So aliens. So it said there were more of the small than of the full grown. So, okay. Go. Goblins, not mm-hmm. tall men. All right. Um, and they were all clad with brilliant white raiment that they appeared to rise off the mountain south of Chimney Rock, about as high as Chimney Rock, which was itself 350 feet, no, 315 feet in the air, but it was like 2,300 feet. I think they elevation. ate the wrong mushroom. I know, right? <laughs> oh my God, I know. And so they, it was like they were circling. They kept on saying they were like circling and they would reach the rock. And then two of the little white people rose up in the air. And then a third one came shortly after them. And they moved towards the group of people that are watching them, like out towards the cotton field. And they said that they had these three had the nearest resemblance to men of any that they had seen. Then all the others, I guess, rose up after. And in the same order and direction, they followed the ones that had come out and this the group of people who was standing in the cotton field said that this whole thing lasted an hour shit it wasn't just like a quick little oh we thought we saw something they stood out there and watched like like, drawn like you know i know there was not cameras or anything i know like this happened for an hour so they're like like you jebediah go get me like some paper (laughs) and some charcoal charcoal exactly let's you know well what they did do they sent for a man because of course nobody is going to believe anything that they say right like without a man so they send they send for a man named robert searcy and the first time they send for him he doesn't like they don't get a response and then they send again about 15 minutes later and he comes and then he tells the newspaper that he sees what they see that 
you know, he he didn't it, it says he expected to see nothing organized or extraordinary. And then when he came and asked if he saw those people on the mountain, he answered no. But looking a second time, he said he saw more glittering white appearances of humankind than ever had been seen of men at any. And I was like, how do you go from no to I suddenly see thousands and thousands of glittering white people? But it is a weird one. That's that is weird. And he described them the same way that Patsy Reeves had described them about their sizes being different and where they rose and the height that they were at. And that two of them went ahead of the rest of them and all that kind of stuff. He said the exact same stuff. And then the newspaper at the end of this account says whether the above be accountable on philosophical principles or whether it be a prelude to the descent of the holy city, I leave to the impartially curious to judge. Holy city. I, I, is there a holy city up there? I think it's something about like the coming of Christ. <sighs> and then later they have a PS that said the above subscriber has been informed. Oh, on the same evening at the same time in which the above phenomenon appeared, there was seen by a gentleman of character. It was several miles different from the place, a bright rainbow um, where there was no appearance of either clouds or rain, but a haze in the atmosphere. The public are therefore at liberty to judge whether the phenomenon was anything supernatural or whether it was some unusual exhalation or moist vapor from the side of the mountain. Um, wow. Yeah. Hmm. And then so several years after this, mm -hmm. there's this couple who lives at the base of Chimney Rock Falls and they're standing in their doorway looking at the sunset mm -hmm. and they see two armies riding tiny winged horses advancing towards one another across the sky over Chimney Rock. What? And they hear like the Trump <laughs> and they see them like come Catch! together and there's like clash conflict and there's swords and there's groaning and people knocking off their tiny winged horses. Oh, and they said God. it's it lasts 10 minutes and then the shouts of victory and then they all disappear. And three trustworthy people apparently corroborated the story from different places, but no one ever had an explanation for what they had seen. Besides, at one point, they said it was a divine vision of highlights from the not so far distant Revolutionary War. I was like, what? Why? Why? Why would you like the History Channel? Like. <laughs> Like why um, would you do that? Horses? I know. Um, no, I I want to know like what's in the drinking water for real. Or, or yeah, it sounds like I don't know. That is that is bizarre. And I know I'd like I completely am like there is no way that there was a host of like winged mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. charging flying people and grunting, right? But it's. It's in the newspaper. It's got to be true. Got to be true. But if you do, if you type in Chimney Rock Alien War 1806, there are things <laughs> oh that come up. God. But there's, I'm, but there's not a whole lot. I mean, all they have to go on are these newspaper reports. Wow. So like, but there are other people who do talk about the area being like a hotbed of paranormal activity, of well, course. Yeah. Of so course. Yes. now I want to go. So that's the, in the, those are the weird occurrences. So you battles on Chimney You Rock. didn't see anything. I saw nothing like that. <gasps> there was a toad in my pool. It was super loud and kept me up all night. That's <laughs> all I, all I remember about that part of my time. I saw nothing of the sort. Oh man, that is fantastic. Crazy white people. Crazy white people. <laughs> back of animas. Oh, all right. Let's take a break. Let's take a break. Do you want more Strange South every week? We can help. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can join our Facebook fan group, Fans of the Strange South Podcast, to keep the chat going with our whole creepy community. Do you have a story idea for us or a story of your own to share? Email us at stories at the strange south.com. Plus, if you join our Patreon, you not only help support the podcast, you get an exclusive bonus episode for every show and a discount on merch. You can find links to all of these things on our website, thestrangesouth.com, along with photos, links, and show notes from every episode, Strange South t-shirts, mugs, and other goodies. See you there. Wait, what do you... They try to tell us we're too young. <laughs> Why do you have that in your head? I don't know. <laughs> I like that melody. Yeah, I do too. Sometimes the ones you get in your head are just whatever. Just whatever, right? Okay. Mm. So mine is not in North Carolina, but it's in the Carolina. Yay! It's the, the Carolina-themed episode. It is the Carol. That's our three-way, right? <laughs> 
So this takes place in Buford. I've been there. And we've talked about it before with all the hoodoo and yes. paint blue. And I'm trying to think of the people. And I've just told you oh, the blank. Low Country. Low um, Country. The uh, Gullah Geechee. Yes. The Gullah Geechee people. That just totally went blank. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so this is Buford, South Carolina. Or I should say in Buford, South Carolina, there is a castle. No. uh There is. Or castle-ish. <laughs> right. It is a home that is in the Greek Revival style. It has medieval undertones. It, when you think of like a southern gothic haunted house, this is the one that you would draw. Mm. And the pictures of it are just amazing. Oh, cool. Right? Uh, it has 79 windows and 23 rooms and eight fireplaces. Oh, my God. Pretty big. It is, it is castle-like big. Uh, the front veranda has six massive columns that are uninterrupted. So it means that instead of like bringing the pieces in mm -hmm. to build the columns up, they created the columns in one big, long, two-story size column. Holy shit. And then shit. they, you know, hoisted it up um, when they were building it. And it is only, yeah, it is two stories high. In the morning, the reason they call it the castle, because it overlooks this estuary, this river. And so it makes it seem like it has a moat. I was going to ask if it had a moat. <laughs> it does. It does. It's the river that kind of runs around it. And there's, you know, there's ducks, there's herons, there's eg egrets. Uh, it's this T-shaped plan. So when you look in the front and you have like the big columns and then you go back and it tees out in the back. And when you go in, it also has a double staircase, which makes, makes it kind of unique. It's, it says it's one of the most photographed homes in the country. But since I've never seen it before, I'm going to <laughs> argue that. But it may be. It's obviously very famous there. The Prince of Tides, Forrest oh. Gump, Forces of Nature were filmed in and around the castle. Oh, okay. And in 1988, Bill Roach, 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 it's not in, <laughs> Roach, Roach, <laughs> is Roach, Bill Roach, a father of six, and happened to be the Beaufort mayor of the time, purchased the property and in 2006, the property was listed for $4.5 million. Yes. And of course, because of this um, huge property, there is a ghost. Uh -oh. and, I mean, there, there has to be a ghost, oh, right? Yeah. How could there not? How could there not? All right. So going back, so about the ghost. In 1562, so way back... Jean Ribot, a French naval officer and a colonizer, and his Huguenots. And if you don't remember what a Huguenot is, it is the religious group, like Cal Calvist, maybe? Calvinist? Calvinist, yes. Uh, French Protestants. Okay. Came over and were trying to colonize Florida in that area and, uh, and you know, along the shores. And... um. He founded or helped found the outpost of Charles Fort in Paris Island, which is in, you know, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. The colony, although failed for several reasons, uh, they froze to death. <laughs> They starve. I'm sorry. That's not laughing. It's just... I know. It's like South Carolina. How can you freeze to death? But I guess, I guess it happens. I, I don't mean, think it's they're like, very good at colonizing. They, they were not prepared. They were not prepared colonists, right? And I mean, if you make it all the way across the Atlantic, I know, then just freeze to death. That's just, that's unfortunate. Right. It is unfortunate. So he, um, you know, he, he goes there and then he um, went down and. Uh, took command of Fort Caroline, which is now Jacksonville, Florida. And he, you know, attempts to colonize Florida. Uh, however, unfortunately, you know, he was only there for like two years and many of his followers were massacred by the Spanish soldiers near St. Augustine. Oh. So we're in that St. Augustine area that we've talked about before. Mm -hmm. And I think we talked about before how it went from French to Spanish to French to Spanish 
to French to British to Spanish mm. to French. I mean, it was all it was like, your lighthouse episode, right? It was. You, yeah, it was the lighthouse, you know, um, episode. Interesting tidbit in 2018, the shipwreck of Ribos flagship La Trinite uh, was located off the coast of Cape Canaveral, Florida. Oh, so that's interesting. A hmm. um, little bit of tidbit there. But we're not here to talk about so much Ribo. We're here to talk about Gauche. Gauche? So Gauche is the dwarf name of the supposed jester that came with um came with Ribot what? over when he was colonizing oh, came over from France. They brought a jester? This is the story. Oh, priorities people. Right. So Ribot, maybe this is why he wasn't such a good colonizer I and swear. was froze to death, right? Karma also. Right. There you go, buddy. <laughs> so you know, R- Ribot left Charles Fort under the command of an experienced soldier named Albert de la Pierre. And unfortunately for the colonist that came over, Pierre was somewhat of a sadist. Oh, God. <laughs> and, and turned out to be pretty, like, cruel disciplinary. Uh, you know, after Ribot went to Florida to deal, you know, with colonizing over there, uh, Pierre like started dealing out like these punishments and they became like increasingly severe. Like so obviously power went to his head. He ordered one colonist hung for a small infraction. He banished a soldier named Lacher to a nearby island for like an unrecorded misdemeanor. Lacher was promised food and water, but Captain Pierre uh reneged on that and when he did that the whole garrison like turned on him oh. so they mutinied they executed Pierre, and they rescued their um compadre and then they froze to death <laughs> I don't know. I, why do i keep laughing every time you say they froze to death i don't know because it, then it, they seems froze a, to death. it seems absurd right so uh rebo promised to return within six months but he didn't So now, you know, they don't have a leader, which is a good thing, but also a bad thing. And they ran out of supplies and the remaining like colonists, they were like trying to build a ship to go back to Europe. And this is where, you know, Gauche, the jester, was either in on this with these people or not. And and it's not like, I don't know if there's written how much written account it seems very fuzzy so this may be totally made up (laughs) for the um purpose of having a colorful ghost i was gonna say for the halloween tours for the halloween tours right but captain pierre um you know said that maybe that he hung um the dwarf or you know there's also other accounts of his death that maybe he you know fell to disease which is not unheard of uh, that Gauche may have been kept by his mates turn cannibals. Oh, damn. Um, that took a turn. Right. On the <laughs> way back to wherever on a sea voyage. Because obviously, like, they came over. They they were not, I guess, big into surviving and, <laughs> and like, growing your own crops. And <laughs> they keep, suck at this. Keeping yourself warm. How did they, is there not a test you have to take? Right. Well, you know, if they, <laughs> brought a a gest, right, if they brought a jester over, then you can kind of see where their priorities lie. For real. Right. I mean, it's like, you know, you we're going to have plant. plenty of time for leisure. <laughs> right. And, and folly. Right. <laughs> One version is that Gauche was among three colonists killed in a brawl. Um, reputedly, he had died during a battle um, at Charlesport and paled on a pike. Gee. Um, and this when where this happened, this is kind of the the story that a lot of people go with that he was impaled on a pike that would be near the land site of Doctor Joseph Johnson, who is the person who built the castle. Oh, okay. this is where the castle plays into it. So the Johnson family constructed this huge castle-like beautiful home in 1859, right before the Civil War. Um, he moved his family into it in 18. Did I say 1959? I'm sorry, in 1859. Oh, I thought you said 1859. 1859. 
Uh, he moved them into it in 1861, and it was not completely done yet because the Union Army was like doing blockades and they weren't able to ship over the goods and, and stuff. So they were living there, but it was still incomplete. Um, it was actually the castle was the last house built before the Union occupation in the town of um, Beaufort in December of 1861. Hmm. And then once the war started and they took over the area, federal troops made use of the Johnson's home as like living quarters. And then they turned it into a military hospital. And back in that time, like a lot of the kitchens were detached from the main house. Oh yeah. So you didn't burn everything down. So you didn't burn everything down. And so they turned the um, back house kitchen into a morgue during the war as well. But it's also said that Johnson, before they occupied his house, that he buried all of his possessions, like all of his richly goods underneath the floorboards of the kitchen. And so, you know, that's kind of like been the hearsay, like, did he dig it back up? Are there still like goods underneath there and whatnot? So after the war and the house was complete, um, the gardeners started to report apparitions. Mm. And the doctor said himself that he once saw um, a dwarf walking outside the house. So this is, um, you know, this is apparently supposed to be Gauche. And we didn't know what his name was or who he was until his daughter, Lily, uh, said to have seen and, and talked with him. So that the homeowner's daughter, the homeowner's daughter who inherited the house and gotcha. then, you know, she lived there. Um, bum, bum. But like I said, there's no documentation of uh, anything about the Huguenot dwarf ever sailing over to North America or anything like that. So this, again, hearsay and apparently what maybe the spirit told the family and we know how spirits are, right? Such liars. Such liars. Mm. All right. So the daughter of Johnson is Lily Danner. And in an interview with Harper Bazaar magazine, magazine, <laughs> magazine mm. uh, it was reported that she saw the specter of Gauche many times when she was a child. And apparently the, the jester would uh, show himself to like sick children that lived in the Aww. castle. And keep them company. And it said, Lily, was That's it still scary? <laughs> I don't know, right? Well, it gets better. So I keep you company. Lily had tea parties that she would have with her dolls in the basement of the castle. Oh and this my is God. where he would appear. And he would have this colorful jester's blouse with hose and stockings and pointed shoes and cap and bells, like the whole nine yards. And, you know, Miss Danner would say that Gauche himself was never really like quite visible, visible, but, you know, he would come and he would tap on the t uh, table. And whenever he would tap, you know, sometimes a person would tap back and they would converse that way. Right. And the Danners had trouble understanding Gauche at first. So they started to write down the taps and they figured out how the fuck they figured this out. <laughs> is they figured out that he was tapping in an archaic French, like, language. What? So they found somebody that could <laughs> translate this archaic French language that Gauche was speaking through his SOS taps or whatever. <laughs> like, it can't just be Morse code. It's got to be it, like... it's Yes. And so it how, it would, yeah. however that works, we're just like, we're suspending all reality here. Right? <laughs> But so in the Tales of Beaufort by uh, Nels S. Graydon, it says it actually has like a transcript of a conversation that was recorded in this archaic French mm -hmm. tapping. And Gauche says, this is Gauche. <laughs> What's up, y'all? <laughs> <laughs> and the guest would say, what are you doing here? And he would say, I live here in the cellar. Oh, God. And they would go, why? And Gosh says, it reminds me of my English home that I will never see again. And the guest said, will you let me see you? And Gosh says, no, I do not show myself to fools. Uh, 
<laughs> no, Lord. It's also said by the Danners that he swore a lot and he would always that gauche. Yes, so gauche. <laughs> he, he would swear a lot and use words the same way. And they kept saying this phrase that he has no opinion of anyone. And I'm like, well, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> has no opinion of any. I was like, isn't that not a good thing to uh, like have not like an opinion? So he's not judgmental. He's not judgmental, like, but they were saying it like he's a like he's an asshole. Like hmm. maybe he doesn't care for anybody or yeah. he doesn't want anything. To, but it's just like that phrase just perplexing. So apparently during this time, the 1940s, he called one of the family family members a hellion mm-hmm. one night and. That was it for Mrs. Danners. She wouldn't have nothing like pearl clutching. That's she, the thing. That's the thing wow. that she was like. I I never listened to him after that. <laughs> but her brother called Gauche like a little rough customer who always swears and has no opinion of anyone. Okay. Okay. So house guests have reported that Gauche is like something like a poltergeist. He likes to move furniture. Uh, closed doors at night, and you would always hear bells. Oh. Reportedly, the ghost also has left his red handprint on the house's window. Why does he have a red handprint? What has he been doing? I do not know. He obviously has no opinion <laughs> about anything. Is not judgmental, but, you know, maybe, I don't know. So, that said, Gosh has been blamed for the Great Roast Heist of 1969. What? What? The what? The what heist? So, the the roast. Roast As in meat. Like roast and potatoes. He stole a roast. So, according to the Beaufort Gazette, at 6 p.m. November 8, 1969, Mrs. Howard Danner of East Street opened her oven to remove the roast her maid had placed in there that afternoon. The oven was empty (gasps) and there was no trace of the roast anywhere in the kitchen. Can you imagine just opening up the newspaper and be like, oh shit. (laughs) What What happened to Mrs. Danner's roast? What happened Mrs. Howard Danner, who we do not know your first name? Yeah. First name is Mrs. Mrs. So Mrs. Danner had just taken the maid home and had left the house door unlocked, as you do, back in 1969. And according to the report of the, because she called the cops, y'all, of the report of the Beaufort City Police Officer J.D. Smith, either a very hungry person entered the house while (laughs) Mrs. Danner was gone, or it must be surmised that the ghost of the Danner house... Oh, my God. And that is Gosh, the Huguenot ghost, became hungry and absconded with the practically cooked roast, being yeah. unable to withstand the temptation and waiting for it to cook. I mean, what does that police report or looks like? What if like? the maid just didn't ever put it in? <laughs> oh, you know what? I have seen if they had dogs. I, have, I know. I have, I have I've seen, seen the Christmas story. Have eat a whole roast yeah. before and nothing left. Bumpus. So. The roast thief, spectral or human, struck again the following night Mm. at 707 North Street, home of Mrs. Isaiah Thomas. Mrs. Isaiah, or excuse me, Mrs. Thomas, again, we do not know her first name because obviously it's not important. (laughs) Unlike Mrs. Danner, had taken the precaution of locking her door, leaving her roast unattended. When she returned from a visit with nearby relatives, her supper was gone missing, too. And, of course, (laughs) she filed a police report because L.H. Martin, the police officer reporting this incident, wrote, When Mr. and Mrs. Thomas returned hungry and ready to feast on roast, the roast was gone. (laughs) There has been no evidence of forced entry. Therefore, it must be Beaufort's castle ghost. Must be. The little person who haunts that area. Oh, my. Why did he care about your roast? Why? He does he, not he, eat things. He does not eat things. He's hanging out, painting his hand Red. on the window <laughs> of the basement, y'all. Roast blood. Roast blood. So that is the castle oh of my Beaufort, God. South uh, Carolina. Uh, interesting thing. 
my roommate in college is she has I'm gonna try to pronounce this word y'all a chrondoplasia phobia which is the fear of little people or people <gasps> with dwarfism what for sure we could not go out and if there's anybody that had dwarfism she like full-on panic attack and we had to leave did that happen very much once <laughs> And then that's... we we talked about it for like years. <laughs> that's after that. Odd. It is odd, but it is a thing. It's also known as nanosophobia, or and this is really horrible, y'all. The lollipop guild phobia. Oh my god! Really? Yeah. They say that. They say that. So um, oh. <laughs> it is. So the uh, at- atrinoplasia or whatever. I'm sure I'm slaughtering that word is the skeletal disorder of the cartilage that forms during the fetal stage that the condition leads to dwarfism. But that's just an odd thing, and I didn't know existed, but wow. it does exist. Wow. And that is the jester ghost <laughs> of the so castle. Bizarre. I know, <laughs> South Good. Carolina. Oh, thank you, Patrice. That yes. made my evening. <laughs> You're welcome. What the hell? Those are the worst colonists ever. I know. I think it was just all like, you know, I just, they're like, it can't be that hard. It can't be that hard. We are and, French. Oh. Yeah, exactly. And, and there's like tales of cannibalism and just, I mean, well, we all know like yellow fever and the, the freezing to death, though. I'm <laughs> like, come on, y'all. It's like. Did you not pack your winter coats? I mean, <laughs> there's wood you can burn. I mean, I've watched alone. Like, you can, like, do a little hut and burn shit. There's trees, right? How did you freeze to death? South I just, Carolina. I just, in South Carolina, of all places. It must have been, you know, I don't know. I don't know either. We'll never know. We will never know. Well, thank y'all for listening so much. Thank you. We appreciate it. And we'll talk to you later. Bye.